Hello there, and welcome to another Let's Read. In this case, it's Steve Jackson's The Citadel of Chaos. A thrilling fantasy and adventure in which you are the hero. This is gamebook number two in the Fighting Fantasy series. Now this, I'm not reading from the Reissium. Actually, uh, I've got my hands on a second-hand copy of this. So, I did think about getting the Reissue, but I thought, given the Reissues that I've seen... And the fact that I didn't particularly like the artwork in them, although it did grow on me. I'd rather look for a second-hand copy that was in as good a condition as I can get. And I haven't been disappointed. The original artwork still looks good. It's uh, artwork by Russ Nicholson. Although it can be a bit divisive, some of it. Okay, so straight into the gameplay. On paragraph one, we have... The sun sets. As twilight turns to darkness, you start your climb up the hill towards the a forbidding shape silhouetted against the night sky. The citadel is less than an hour's climb. Some distance from its walls, you stop to rest. A mistake, as it seems, a fearful spectre from which there is no escape. The hairs on your neck prickle as you look towards it. But you are ashamed of your fears. With grim resolve, you march onwards towards the main gate, where you know guards will be waiting. You consider your options. You have already thought about claiming to be herbalist. Come, uh, come to treat a god with a fever. You could pose as a trader or an artisan, perhaps a carpenter. You could even be a nomad, seeking shelter for the night. As you ponder the possibilities and the yarns you uh, will have to spin to the gods, you reach the main trail leading up to the gates. Two lanterns burn on either side of the portcullis. You hear muffled gruntings as you approach, and two misshapen creatures step forward. On the left stands an ugly creature with the head of a dog and the body of a great ape, flexing its powerful arms. Its opposite number is indeed its opposite, with the head of an ape and the body of a large dog. The latter god approaches you on all fours. It stops, some metres in front of you, raises itself on its hind legs and addresses you. Which story will you opt for? Will you pose as a herbalist? Will you claim to be a tradesman? Will you ask for shelter for the night? You know. I think the easiest out of all of these to claim would be uh, asking for shelter. So let's just go with that. They're, they're, no, they're not going to be heartless bastards, are they? The ape dog tells you that no one else is allowed into the Black Tower after dark. And you'll have to look elsewhere for shelter. Bastard. You may either, you may either resign yourself to a fight, in a 288, or you may pick up a stone and cast a fool's gold spell on it, offering them a nugget of gold as a bribe to let you in. Turn to 96. Deduct the fool's gold spell from your spells, if you use it. You know, that sounds easier than a fight any day of the week. Although then again, these are magical creatures, so maybe they won't be fooled by this particular spell, but let's go with that anyhow. They accept your offering, and summon the gatekeeper, who opens a small doorway in the portcullis to let you in. You leave them squabbling over the gold nugget. Turn to 251. That's a relatively short paragraph, and uh, given that these guys actually got their own artwork dedicated to them, you'd have thought that uh, they'd have played more of a role than that. Maybe they were just really hardcore fighters and you just wanted to really avoid getting into trouble with them. Anyhow, you walk forward into a spacious open courtyard surrounded by large walls. Various lights are burning and groups of figures are shuffling around in the darkness. In the centre of the courtyard is a large monument of some kind, perhaps a fountain. Looking across the yard, you can see what appears to be the main entrance to the tower. Will you creep around the wall towards the tower? Stride boldly across the courtyard. Tiptoe through the shadows towards one of the groups. It's only because of any meaning many more. You know, let's just stride across the courtyard. After all, we're a hero. Let's just stride. It's the kind of thing heroes do when they're not being sneaky. As you step out of the shadows towards the centre of the courtyard, a voice in the wind cries, HALT! STAND YOUR GROUND! You whirl around, but you can see no one addressing you. You take another couple of steps. Again, the eerie voice orders you to stop, and this time an arrow zings through the air and lands close to your left foot. You jump back. Still, you can see no one, but now you are stuck. Will you press on? Very cautiously? Make a dash for the monument in the centre of the yard. Cast a shielding spell around you in advance. Let's go with that spell. That sounds useful here, given somebody's shooting arrows at me. Might also be an idea to uh, have an option to call out to say, what's the matter? But that doesn't seem to be an option here. You cast the spell, 
and advance. Four or five arrows sing towards you, but stop in the air and meet up before they reach you, dropping harmlessly to the ground. You reach the monument. Remember to cross the shielding spell off your list. Well, that was handy. Useful spell, that one. You cast your eyes over the strange structure. It appears not to be a fountain, but a temple of some sort. To one side there is a door, which you may investigate, or you may press onwards towards the citadel itself. If you wish to press onwards, turn to 156. If you wish to investigate, turn to 362. Let's investigate. That's got to be worthwhile. After all, we're right there, aren't we? We're right next to it, we may as well. Who knows what we might miss out on. The door opens and the small room inside is lit by candlelight. Cautiously, you look inside to see a strange sight. On a stone altar, in the middle of the chamber, are three silver chalices, each containing a different coloured liquid, one clear, one red, and one milky. Filtering around the altar are three small, winged, gremlin-type creatures, all chirping excitedly. Every so often, one lands on the altar and takes a sip of the milky liquid. The open door creaks on its hinges and startles them. They whirl around to see you and become very excited. You may either enter the chamber or close the door quickly and press onwards. Let's go in there. I mean, we're already in. I mean, this can't possibly be an ominously dangerous situation. Three different chalices, three different goblin type things with wings, three different colours in each of the chalices. Let's just go and see what uh, what this leads to. Sudden death? I don't think so. Probably a long, painful, slow, lingering death. As you enter, the gremlins flutter and squeak excitedly. They fly past you, through the door and out into the night. You are now alone with the chalices. Will you risk taking a drink? If so, will you choose the clear liquid, the red, the milky, or will you leave and head for the citadel? Ooh, well, we've just unwittingly released three gremlins who could be doing absolutely anything to anybody at this point, and then we've got these three liquids, which we may or may not drink. Ooh, I'll tell you what, let's uh, let's go for the milky liquid, and I'll just keep a, I'll keep a. a, a note of this paragraph number so I can go back to it if I die horribly and want to start over. The milky liquid smells sweet. You take a sip and start to giggle. You take a gulp and burst out laughing for no reason at all. No wonder the little gremlins were enjoying it so much. Lightheaded and in fine spirits, you leave the chamber to make your way towards the citadel. Add two stamina points for this re refreshing incident. Well, that was better than I thought. I was kind of expecting to... Uh, Gag over and die. Let's just move on then and just leave everything else alone. As you stride across the open courtyard, you notice that you're walking alongside a small mound, almost like a buried pipeline running from the black tower to the temple. You bend over to investigate it. Perhaps it could have been made by a mole of some kind. As you touch the mound, it caves in and, to your horror, a long grey tentacle covered in warty growths bursts out of the ground and wraps itself around your leg. How will you fight this thing? Draw your sword, cast a levitation spell, or cast a fire spell. Hmm. You know, I think a fire spell might be useful here. Let's just go with that. 114. You point to the base of the tentacle and cast your spell. A puff of smoke and flash of light burst from the hole in the ground. A shudder runs through the tentacle, and thankfully, it releases its grip. As it retreats back into the ground, you rub your leg to get the circulation back, and then set off towards the main entrance to the citadel again. Remember to deduct the fire spell and turn to 218. Well, that was lucky. Tentacle versus fire. Except no substitute. Fire every time. In front of you is a large wooden door, firmly locked. You may either knock three times for the guard, or you may use a strength spell to try to open it. Let's be polite and just knock three times on the door if you want me. Twice on the pipe. Pop, pop. If the answer is no. Yeah, I'll, just, I'll stop now. That was deliberately bad on my part, I promise you. The door opens and a large, brutish creature steps out. It wants me to stop singing. It has a sharp horn in the middle of its forehead and its skin appears to be armour-plated. It grunts to ask you what you want and demands a password before letting you in. Do you know the password? If so, turn to 273. If not, you will have to bluff your way in. Well, I remember saying earlier I'm going to basically be in god mode here. Uh, but I, that doesn't allow me to cheat in the way of knowing things I don't know. I'll plow through the fights, absolutely fine, but I'm not going to cheat in any other way. So I don't know the password, so 
I have to put, turn to page 198, or rather paragraph 198. Why am I saying pages? <laughs> you think quickly. You reach into your bag and pull out a handful of weeds. Uh-oh. He's going to have the munchies. He's going to be wanting to uh, empty the refrigerator without knowing what the refrigerator is and listen to Bob Morley music without even knowing what Bob Morley is or how he could possibly be listening to his music right now. Showing them to the creature, you explain that you are a herbalist and have come to treat the Lord's Librarian, who is dreadfully ill. The messenger never told you of any passwords. Will he believe you? Test your luck. If you're lucky, he believes you and lets you in. If you're unlucky, he doesn't care who you are. You may not enter without the password and he advances towards you with a spike. Uh, we were lucky, we were lucky, because well, I am going to cheat in that regard. I don't want to fight this fucker. Uh, <clears throat> Alright, 177... You are in a narrow hallway. This continues for several metres and ends in a doorway. Halfway along the passage, you can see an archway where some steps lead downwards. Will you go forwards to the door or creep down the steps? Decisions, decisions. Let's go to the door. You know, just blindly going forward seems to have done me no ill so far. You try the handle of the door and it turns opening into another hallway. Some distance along, the passageway turns to the right and ends shortly in another door. On this door is a sign which reads, Please ring for butler. A rope, evidently the bell, hangs by the door. Will you ring as instructed or try the door handle? Let's be let's be polite here. Let's just ring the bloody door handle. And Oh my god, the artwork is uh, disgusticating. It's a hunchback butler. After several moments, the door opens slowly and a hunchbacked, misshapen creature with rotten teeth, rugged hair and tattered clothes stands in front of you. Yes, sir. <laughs> what can I do for you? Growls a half-human creature. I'm expected, you reply, and walk past him through the door with confidence. He is a little bewildered by your manner and stammers, not knowing whether to challenge you or not. Which way to the reception, you demand. He squints at you through one eye and motions towards a left fork in the passageway a short distance ahead. Will you believe him and take the left fork? Or do you distrust the shifty uh, creature and take the right fork? Hmm... Let's just see here. He squints at you through one eye and motions towards the left fork, fork in the passage a short distance ahead. You know, I think he's terrified enough of me to uh, be telling the truth, so let's just go with that. Let's assume that he's being honest with me. The passage runs along for several metres and then ends at a door. You listen at the door and hear a deep, heavy breathing coming from inside, as if some large creature were asleep in there. Cautiously, you try the handle and the door opens. Just inside, although the room is dark, you can see that a very large goblin-like creature is asleep on the floor. You may either risk tiptoeing into the room, or you may return to the fork and try the right-hand passage. Let's try the tiptoeing me method. We don't get anything uh, out of these kind of books by pussyfooting around. Tiptoeing, on the other hand, is uh, perfectly acceptable. It's something different. And oh dear, there's dedicated artwork, so this, this is going to be an encounter, isn't it? You tiptoe into the room. The room is gloomy and the air is damp. A crude wooden post is nailed to one wall with several hooks on it. There are two doors in the four wall leading onwards. On the post, hanging on the wall, is a makeshift mirror, but as your torch lights up the mirror, its reflection is thrown against the eyes of the sleeping giant who grunts and stirs. One eye opens. Then another, and seeing you, it springs to its feet. It grabs an axe, which it was using as a pillow, and quickly undoes the leather sheath to reveal a sharp bronze head. This giant creature is a gawk. Large and brutish, gawks are half goblin, half giant, bred by master sorceress for their aggressive character. Although somewhat stupid, they are other tough beasts with a raw warlike nature. Will you make a dash for the doors? Draw your sword ready for a fight. Apologise for disturbing the creature, or prepare to use a spell. Let's see if an apology uh, will work on this fella. You never know, it might actually be more smart and more intelligent and even civilised than uh, the actual writing tells us. What will your approach be? You may either tell the creature that you're a guest, or you may try to bribe the god by offering it three gold pieces, real gold pieces, or by using a fool's gold spell to create some gold to offer to it. Oh, let's just tell it we're a guest and see where that gets us. The god straightens up, Lows its axe and begins apologising to you for being asleep at its post. At its insistence, you agree not to tell anyone. The creature offers to take your tunic, 
but you declaim it off and press onwards. Will you take either the left hand door or the right hand door? Mm, well, we were going left before, so let's just continue going left, I think. I'm just assuming we were going left, to be honest. I'm uh, not entirely certain at this point. Not anymore, anyhow. The door opens and you stride onwards, slamming a trip behind you. A short distance ahead, you reach a three-way junction, where you take the northwards passage. This continues for several metres, leading to another door. You can hear laughter and merriment on the other side. Cautiously, you open the door into a large room where a party of a dozen or so creatures, of all shapes, sizes and colours, are playing games. As you step into the room, a voice shouts, Look! This must be Glass Dodd's foot! Whereupon, they all welcome you, inviting you to join the fun. Evidently, they are expecting someone and have mistaken you for their missing guest. Will you play along and join them? Or will you tell them they are mistaken and try to make your way over to the door on the other side of the room? You know, I think if I go and tell them that they're mistaken, that might lead to a fight. But then again, if I play along, you know what's going to happen. The real person's going to uh, show up, so... Er, eeny, meeny, miny, let's just go with the pretense here. Let's go and uh, tell them that we are who we aren't. Come on, pages turn a little faster than that. There we go. They clap you on the back and welcome you in. A dark-skinned, wiry creature thrusts a mug of grog into your hand. You drink the ale down in one. Another mug comes. Add two stamina points, as the ale is quite refreshing. Then they invite you to join the games. Will you play Knifey Knifey, Rune Zones or Six Pack? Knifey Knifey, why do I get the feeling I know exactly what that's going to be? Let's go there and see what it is. You have chosen a deadly gambling game, which is outlawed in most kingdoms. <laughs> Since you have chosen to play, you must play at least one game, but you, must play mo you may play more if you wish. Your games master is an apprentice sorcerer, and he has selected a choice of prizes for you. If you survive, you may claim either two extra spells, which you may choose from the list at the beginning of the book, 50 gold pieces, or an enchanted breastplate, which will allow you to deduct two points from a creature's dice roll when thrown for its attack strength. All of those are actually quite easy. Uh, you know, all of those are actually quite useful. I haven't actually came across any shops of any sort yet, so I don't know if the gold pieces would be that useful, though. Hmm. The game is played like this. Six daggers lie on a table. One is a real weapon, while the other five have spring-loaded blades and will do you no harm. Well, it's not quite what I was expecting. I was expecting the game where you have to make the knife move around uh, your fingers without actually cutting them. Uh, what's that called again? By finger furly or something like that. Something along those lines, but obviously this is something else. You are playing the game against one of the other creatures in the room and only one of you will survive, oh god. In turn, you must select one of the daggers and stab yourself in the chest with it. If the dagger is real, death is certain. If it is a dummy, it must be returned to the table to be shuffled back with the other five. The game continues until one of you selects the real dagger and stabs yourself through the heart whereupon the survivor can claim the prize. Your opponent will make the first selection. There must be a few dead bodies in this, uh, you know, in this establishment, if uh, this is what happens. Ooh, they must be tidy them away rather quickly. Your opponent will make the first selection. Throw one die for him, then do the same for yourself. As soon as one of you rolls a six, the real dagger has been chosen. If this is you, you will have killed yourself. Now, if you're one of these people that is always really good at rolling sixes, you'd be in for a bit of a shock with this game, wouldn't you? Yeah, well. Now, knowing the rules of the game, you can only get out of playing at least once by casting an illusion spell. Otherwise, you must play. After you have played, you may either play six-pack, or you may bid your friends farewell and leave the room. Hmm, I'm wondering what would happen if I actually cast the illusion spell. Obviously, if I play the game properly, um... Uh, there's a very good chance that I will kill myself. And continue like that until either I'm dead or he's dead. <laughs> Let's cast the illusion spell and see what happens there. Let's risk. Let's get a bit risky because we're uh, coming up to the 20 minute mark. Or will I survive up to the 20 minute mark? Let's see. Under your illusion spell, the crowd of onlookers see you start playing the game. 
We watch for a couple of rounds and the tension mounts. They decide it's prudent to leave the room without wasting more time. <laughs> I survived. Who would have thought it? You leave the room through the door at the far end, which opens into a short passageway ending at a large wooden door. The handle on this door turns, letting you into a large chamber. The room you're in is some sort of grand dining hall. A long table, large enough to seat some 40 or 50 people, stands in the centre. Edged with chairs, various doors and passageways lead from the room, but you're particularly interested in two wide staircases which lead upwards to either end of the balcony overlooking the hall. Paintings and suits of armour decorate the hall. The room is empty. Will you take the left hand staircase upwards, take the right hand staircase upwards, investigate the paintings, investigate the suits of armour? Well, I'll tell you what I have to do here. I have to choose to stop this right here because otherwise I could go on like this all night. Because we've just hit the 20 minute mark. So, yeah. That was rather fortuitous, I suppose. Uh, what are my opinions as of this point, having played roughly 20 minutes? Obviously, God, knows, uh, God Mode itself has protected me. I mean, let's face it, everybody will have played these games at one point or another by cheating effectively, by not actually going through the combat systems, which does obviously defeat part of the point of it. But it does, in this case, allow me to sort of get through the book further in one go for the purposes of this let's read or let's play or stroke mini review and of course the proper review will be up later once I've uh, edited this and whatnot but I've got to say I like that I really enjoyed it uh, I've always found Steve Jackson's writing to be very easy to get along with there are some writers out there uh, of adventure game books who unfortunately they're their prose, so to speak, is sometimes quite infuriating to read through, and you kind of wish that they actually had an editor to sort of suggest better ways of, uh, of putting things. Although in some cases I kind of get the feeling that they don't, don't care for a third party's opinion. But no, I've always found Jackson's writing to be easy to get along with, very clear, very detailed where it needs to be. And the gameplay feels good to, uh, to me. I can quite happily, I can quite happily continue reading that book and playing the game for another couple of hours if I, uh, if I wanted to. I don't have that kind of time, but you know, I do like it. It was rather good. So, if you don't have this and you don't want a second-hand copy and you want to get the reissue, yeah, I would recommend it. Go get the reissue if you want to get a second-hand copy. Go looking for them because they are in pretty reasonable conditions and pretty reasonable prices. And you will enjoy it, I promise you. If you are a fan of this sort of uh, book, you will enjoy reading through it. That's it. I'll say my goodnights and I'll see you next time. Bye, bye.